My name is Jonathan Shaw. I'm in charge of 6 Platoon, B Company, 3 Para. With me on this presentation team, I have Corporal Steggles, who's been my senior section commander for the last two years. I also have Lance Corporal Gannon, who's been my senior private soldier for the last two years. He's since been promoted to Lance Corporal as a result of his exploits on Mount Longdon. The aim of this presentation is to bring out the low-level problems of command as experienced on Mount Longdon. Specifically, I shall try to relate my experiences to PCD teaching. The corporals will try and bring out problems at section level and at individual private soldier level. The battle for Mount Longdon took place on the night of the 11th and 12th of June, 1982. For the 10 days prior to that battle, the battalion had been stationed at Estancia House, some nine miles to the west of Mount Longdon. During that 10 days, we were waiting for a break in the weather for artillery to be brought up into positions where they could support any attack on Mount Longdon. During this time, patrols from D Company went out and wrecked what we knew to be our objective, Mount Longdon. The information that they gathered from these patrols led to the following int picture. There was a minefield to the south of Mount Longdon, which had to be avoided. And it was thought that there were troops up to two companies in strength of troops on Mount Longdon, mainly concentrated towards the far end of Mount Longdon, that is, the eastern edge of Mount Longdon. The Colonel's plan was that C Company should stay in reserve, A Company should move and seize the ground to the north of Mount Longdon, and B Company should move on Mount Longdon itself. The company commander's plan was as follows. Because of the difficulty of access to the summit of Mount Longdon, the western summit, he deployed only one platoon onto that peak. That was six platoon. Four and five platoon would skirt round just to the north of Mount Longdon, moving up onto the ridge of Mount Longdon itself about halfway along, and then deploying to take out what were thought to be the major enemy positions on the eastern end of Mount Longdon. From this, I had to extract my platoon plan. I had about 40 minutes in total to extract, plan, and, give, and uh, prepare my orders. This was ample time, and I could have allowed myself more, but this was the time I allowed myself to, give, to allow the rest of the battle preparation to go ahead. In war, it is well to point out that it is easier to give orders in war than in peacetime. The ground picture is known to all troops. The basic information about one's objective is known. I'd taken my platoon to close to the objective three days beforehand, so the ground was familiar to all the troops. The orbit of a platoon in war is permanent, whereas on, in peacetime, in my experience, one has a different orbit every time one goes in the field. And finally, one is so practiced in giving orders when you're in the field for a long time that the orders process just comes naturally. And so timings for orders in the field tend to be much shorter than in peacetime. My platoon for the operation on Longdon had been bolstered to 36 men. In my, company head, in my platoon headquarters, I had an extra machine gun, an extra 84mm plus an NCO. I had two members of patrol platoon who had been on the hill and could show us the way. I had an engineer who would help in case of mines. I had a medic who would form my total medical and Kazivac um, aid. And I also had one MFC. As I say, a bolstered up platoon of 36 men. 
This allowed me great flexibility because it's allowed me to have three fighting sections plus a strong reserve of some 12 men in my platoon HQ who I could reserve, use as a reserve. My objective was some 300 meters wide and some 750 meters long. And so I needed all these forces to write any kind of coherent plan to take the objective. I planned to send one section to the southern end of Mount Longdon to clear that flank. Two section, I planned to deploy down the center of the feature. And three section, I gave the task of clearing the rocks on the northern end of Mount Longdon. The in picture upon which I had to plan this plan was extremely scanty. There were vague rumors of the odd machine gun post being on the southern flank. Perhaps there was a mortar position on the central ridge. And there were thought to be some troops in the rocks on the north. Hence the plan that I came up with. To move on to what actually happened. The battalion crossed the staff line 15 minutes late. We marched B Company onto their objective in total silence. And six platoons split from the rest of the company, moving independently on up the face of Longdon. The face of Longdon from the approach we took was that steep. We had to march in single file, snaking our way between the rocks up to the summit of Longdon. One enemy would have picked us all off, no problems at all. But fortunately, there was no sign of any enemy. There was no gunfire. There was no light. And we made it to the top of the hill without seeing any enemy. And seemingly, the whole mountain was completely deserted. All we'd found were abandoned positions, uh, discarded rubbish, empty tents on the way up the hill. Just as I reached the summit of the hill, which was to be my release point for my sections, there was an extremely loud explosion off to my left to the north, and that was when the battle for Mount Longdon began. This is worth pointing out at this stage the true nature of the enemy's strengths and dispositions on Mount Longdon. In addition to the one minefield that had been detected to the south of Longdon, there was also a minefield to the north of Mount Longdon that had been undetected. Four platoon had just detected it and had walked into that minefield. Also, there were not two companies as had been anticipated. From information gathered from Argentine prisoners and from General Menendez's map, which we captured in Government House, there, were two, there was a complete battalion, a complete battalion of troops on the mountain, reinforced by 100 Special Forces troops considerably more than we never bargained for. And that was why Mount Longdon was such a hard nut to crack. My description of what happens thereafter to 6th Platoon may well sound confused. I give no apology for that. That was the way it was. On the explosion, None of us knew what this was. We thought it might be the mortar position that we'd heard about. As I've said, it was the mine. But at this stage, it only added to the confusion about what exactly was going on. My action on the explosion going off was to deploy my sections. As I have said, the objective was some 300 meters wide, 750 meters long. Once I deployed my sections onto their objectives, to all intents and purposes, I lost direct control of my sections. And my task from then on became to coordinate the progress of my three sections and to be the one man on the mountain who knew where every man was. And that was an extremely difficult task on its own. One section had a clear run down the south side of the hill. They met no enemy, just finding deserted positions. Two sections, similarly, deployed down the backbone of the hill, again, finding no positions, 
just deserted .5 machine guns. I moved with them when I heard to the north three section coming in contact. I moved back to the summit to work out what was going on and try and establish some kind of control. My immediate action was to deploy the 84 millimeters from the headquarters in support of three section. And then I had to inform two and one section that three section were under fire. A lot of play is made on PCD about the effective fire line. But the effective fire line for us was a totally confused affair. One section had reached it, the other two sections had no idea that the three section was under fire. And I had to tell them that the battle had begun in earnest. I ordered them to go firm. And then I called them back to the summit. The position at the summit was extremely confused. We had no idea of the enemy locations, where they were firing from, and I had no picture of what the ground was like that I was fighting over. In fact, what had happened was that we had taken the enemy completely by surprise, and on arrival at the, at the top of the hill, they'd still been in their sleeping bags, fast asleep. Only on the explosion going off had they woken up and started coming out of my, their sleeping bags. By the time they started firing at us, three sections were in the middle of their position and were being fired at both from positions to their front and also by positions to their rear, through positions they'd already moved through. Thus, the position was immediately extremely confused. So I called back two and one section to the summit of the hill to clear the peak. Because I knew where the firing was, I called two section back, told, telling them to retreat along the lines that they had advanced on. This they did. Being closer to the firing, they knew where it was. One section were not so lucky. Communications were bad, they were a long way away from us, it was totally dark, and everyone was pretty disorientated, and they didn't know where the firing was taking place. In consequence, when they were returning to the summit, they spread into extended line, and the end man strayed into the line of fire of the man who was firing at three section, and he was hit by a sniper and went down. Immediately, the man next to him in the line followed in, he was hit. Another man went in to rescue them, he was hit. And within five minutes, I had five men lying on the forward slope, pinned down by some fire that we never caught during the night, we never knew where he was, and in the end he gave himself up the next morning. It was at that stage that I gave the order that no one else was going to go out to the front, to try and rescue these people, because Kazivak at that stage was just impossible. They were pinned down on the forward slope, and there was no way we could get to them. With the remains of one section, and all of two sections who were now at the summit, I now had to extract three sections from the fire that was pinning them down in a gully to my left. This was made extremely difficult, because once the firing had started, four or five platoons to our north had started attacking the objectives that were pinning us down. Fire we were putting down from our objective, on the, from our peak position, our fire was going down and hitting five platoon. And so they ordered us to check firing. In other words, my platoon was pinned down on the summit, paralyzed, unable to move because of the fire being put down the slopes to the front, and unable to cover any movement on that forward slope because of danger of hitting our own troops even further to our front. And so elements of three section had to extract those that weren't injured, had to extract themselves by just rushing out with no covering fire, just using the darkness and lulls in the firing to make their escape. The problem of clearing the position on the summit is one that is much easier said than done over terrain that's just rock and boulder strewn and in total darkness. The firing that had broken out and hit three sections from the rear was soon quelled and the people who'd been firing were taken out. 
However, during the night, we kept wheedling out people who'd been asleep in rocks and had just never bothered to come out of their sleeping bags. During the stages of Kazivak, I sent back two members of Platoon HQ to go and get some blankets from some positions that we detected on the way up. It took them half an hour to come back. When they eventually came back, they came back with six prisoners. The reason for this was they'd been wandering along and they'd suddenly found these tents that no one had discovered before and had taken the occupants prisoner, having killed two who refused to come out of their sleeping bags. So the problem of clearing the position is a very real one and is one that is extremely difficult to do in darkness on terrain that you have no idea of the lie of the land. The sense of disorientation was total. At one stage my company commander phoned, um, radioed into me, asked me how many men I had left. I confess I had very little idea. I told him 15. In fact, looking at the statistics of how many were injured, I never had less than 23 men under command. But it didn't seem like that. Men involved in Kazivak, resupply of ammunition, uh, wreckies of positions, clearances, it gave the impression that I had far fewer men than I had. And only added to the feeling of helplessness and frustration that I felt throughout that night. Clearly I knew that I had to go and get the men in one section who were pinned on the forward slope out of that position, but there was nothing I could do. And we had to leave them there for eight hours during the night. Fortunately, the, the extreme cold lessened the severity of their injuries as it uh, slowed down the rate of bleeding and most of their wounds stopped bleeding after an hour. In the end, after those eight hours, there was a very heavy bombardment and when the position was almost taken on the end and the firing uh, lessened in intensity, I led what remained in my platoon out to the front to take, uh, to rescue the five people on the forward slope. Two were dead, but three were injured and we were happy to get them back. And with the remnants of uh, three section who we finally extracted, I made my way down and reorganized at the bottom of the slope. That was the platoon commander's view of the Battle of Mount Longdon. I'd like now to hand over to Corporal Steggles to give his view, <coughs> the section commander's viewpoint of the battle. Because we realised that we were going to do a night assault and that command and control at night is very, very difficult, we decided at section level that we'd break our sections down into two men fire teams. And this certainly worked with the limitation or the proviso that I put in, and that's one of Kazivak, and we'll cover that later on in the presentation. Putting the men into two men teams for pure admin purposes made it very, very simple to administer the platoon. And while we were in defence, it was easy to put men in, into two, two men into each trench. When we actually took part in the assault, the fact that the men were in two men teams meant that we could give each fire team an individual task. And at night, when command and control was very, very difficult, this made our task on the, on the mountain that much easier. As I said, the only problem with this is with the actual Kazivak of, of, um, with the actual Kazivak problem. Gorsel, can you say a bit about the problems of uh, control on Mount Longdon? Yes, sir. When we were eventually released from the rest of the company and we started to advance up M Mount Longdon, my my section was the point section. I had with me um, uh, a corporal, Corporal Phillips from patrol platoon, who had been on the mountain several times before, and he was acting as a guide with me. Because of the narrowness of the feature, it meant that we had to go up in single file. But from the int and from the orders that I'd received from the boss, um, I knew that our first objective was going to be what appeared to be, through the IWS from a range of about 50 metres, appeared to be um, some kind of a radar on a tripod. In the event, it turned out to be a very uh, sophisticated IWS device on a tripod. Anyway, that was our first objective. As we closed in on this objective, the mine incident, which the boss has already told you about with four platoon, happened. It was at this stage that we were really committed to the attack, and we used the noise and all the disorientation that was going on to the left to make our final bid towards our first objective. Myself and one of the Toms in my section, Dave Rowe, 
we decided that we'd just throw in two grenades into the position and then scoot on past it to try and get to the top of the objective where we knew that there was um, an enemy machine gun and a bunker. This we did, we just lobbed in two L2 grenades, waited for them to go off and then scooted off round the side with the rest of the platoon following up behind us. Once we reached the top of the objective and one, sec uh, one section went to the left and three sections went to the right, that's when all chaos and bedlam really did break loose. We came under heavy fire from .5 Browning machine guns to our front and there was an awful lot of firing and um, loud explosions of, uh, of mines going off and um, light, light anti-tank weapons going off on our left with 4 and 5 platoon were in action. At this stage of the game, it really was down to the Toms it, working in their fire teams to get on with the job they've been given. I'd like to stress that I don't think that you can do this unless you've actually got really well trained and troops that you can rely on and that you know are going to do this. When we got to the top of the feature, it was a case of just letting the blokes off the leash and hoping that they would get on with the job that they'd been given. Thankfully, they'd done this. They, they got on with it. Um, as regards my job, I found myself really just trying to coordinate the actions of my different fire teams that had gone off. Command and control really does go out of the window and you, you're really down to, to try and uh, hoping that these blokes are going to get on with the job. Thanks so much. Cool, Gallant, perhaps you could give us the uh, private side view. Yeah. Uh, when we was out in the Falklands campaign, I was a private soldier in three section. And un until we'd had the new, well, the reinforcements, I was to IC the section. Uh, Cole Wilson and that, once the, the, the firing had started, uh, we had five members of my section was hit all at once. Cole Wilson was pinned down and I was left then to do my own thing, which my first priority was to treat casualties. Uh, the two I see the section then was hit and he'd been shot in the chest. Uh, I was over there helping him and, well, I did what I could for him and then the company medic came across and he took over from the, me there. But there was nobody there to actually tell me what to do. I just had to do it off my own back and uh, do what I could for the blokes. Uh, we was pinned down, as I say, there was only three of the section left. There was one of the other privates, Nick Rose, who was pinned down in a rock just in front of me. Cotton Wilson was pinned down with two casualties with him. And I was pinned down with the platoon sergeant and Private Barrett, who had both been shot. So all I could do really was attend to the casualties and just sit there and wait until things got themselves organized and I could be given further orders or tasks to do. What uh, basic first aid skills did you use? Ah, well, mainly there was, luckily enough, there was only minor injuries, minor gunshot wounds, apart from our 2IC who was shot through the chest and did eventually die. Uh, more or less it was just uh, applying shell dressings and administrating the morphine and just getting the wounds elevated and stopping the bleeding. Cole Gannon, in fact, is too modest. Uh, the uh, doctor down at the RAP at the bottom of Mount Longdon commented after the battle that the uh, standard of first aid administration that had been given on the hill was such that his job in the RAP was simply one of administering their evacuation on helicopters. The uh, six weeks training we'd had on Canberra when we'd concentrated on a lot of first aid training had paid off dividends and um, as I say the standard of first aid training was excellent and he said that he didn't have to do any more work than had already been done on casualties on Longdon, and I think that's a tribute to the private soldier's ability at first aid if he's taught properly. We've mentioned a bit about Kazivak, and it's one that we feel very strongly about, and I just want to dwell on that for a moment. In my description of the battle, it came out that uh, I had five people who died in my platoon. Four of those people died helping other people. The reasons for this are complex and conflicting. Soldiers fight for each other. They put in pairs, they work with each other, and the basis of fire manoeuvre is that you put your life in someone else's hands. 
You see your number two getting hit, and your instinct is to go and help him. And that's what people do. In peacetime, we never train for first aid properly. We never put first aid training into a battle scenario. And what tended to happen when people went to help their mates was that they forgot field craft. And that, to my mind, is why four out of the five people who died in my platoon died helping other people. As a commander, I can see that that is tactically wrong. The only way soldiers are going to be safe on the battlefield is when the enemy objectives are taken out. But no private soldier is going to abandon his mate if he feels that his mate's just not going to be treated. And so he'll go and help his mate, and so the attack will flounder, and so everyone will fail in their objective. That's the problem, as I saw it. I know Corporal Steggles feels particularly strongly about this, and also has views on how it should be resolved for peacetime. If there's one thing that I, I think that I've really learned from the Falcon campaign at section level, and that is that you can put your men in two-men teams, as the boss said, and send them forward, but unless you've got within your unit, battalion, company, or whatever, an effective way of evacuating battlefield casualties, then I'm afraid that when one of the members of the fi the fire, this fire team is hit, then his mates are going to help him. Effectively, that fire team is no longer taking any part in the battle. The momentum of the attack breaks down, and consequently, you don't take your objective, as the boss has already said. How you get round this in a battalion? Well, I don't really know. I know that in peacetime, we certainly don't practice realistically enough Kazivak, and we don't pay enough attention to it. If, if the units that you, you people belong to are anything like, like our units, you'll get people turn up for um, um, an exercise and the casualties are told to jump off the back of a wagon and they lay on a stretcher and you carry them out. You can't do this in wartime. It takes four men to carry one battlefield casualty. That's assuming that you can get a stretcher to carry them out with. The only way around this, as far as I'm concerned, is that if you are going to commit men to close quarter battle, then behind them, directly following up, that's not a tactical bound behind them, that is directly in support of them, you must have the means of casivacking out the people who are, who are going to get hit in this action. And unless the men who are going into action have got this um, reassurance, if you like, that their mates, or themselves even, are going to be carried out, and somebody's going to look after them, then I'm, then I'm afraid when one of them gets hit, he's, his mate's going to go down and he's going to look after him. The only way around it is, for, is to educate our blokes and to get more people to back them up. At the moment, they're talking about cutting the battalions down to 605 or 603 men, whatever it is. It's ludicrous. You, you haven't got enough men with 650 people in an infantry battalion. So Christ knows where you're going to be when you've got 603. The, ma the major Kazivak on that hill was done by Corporal Gannon. The company medic was shot treating his section 2IC and he died. So as you can see, the problem of Kazivak is one that needs to be taken really seriously. Eventually, as I said, B Company took that many casualties that, that we were withdrawn and A Company moved through us, taking out the rest of the objective after an enormous artillery barrage lasting some two hours. We were then moved onto the reverse slope, the western end of Mount Longdon, and there took shelter for the next 36 hours when we were constantly subjected to artillery bombardment. Because we were on a reserve slope, we suffered no casualties in B Company during uh, this time. But even so, the psychological effect of artillery should not be underestimated. Curiously enough, the psychological effect gets worse as time goes on. None of us got used to being under artillery fire. It just played on your nerves subconsciously. Even though we didn't think that we'd be hit because of our position, just it has a constant psychological wearing down effect, which got to us all, especially as it came just after the most harrowing experience of all our lives. 
After the battle, we were left with gruesome after-battle scenes, a litter of bodies, junk, discarded weapons. We had to count the dead, both friendly and enemy. We had to clear the positions of Argentinians who gave themselves up throughout the next day. We had to bury the dead. And as day came, we were left to contemplate the full strength of their position. The mortar positions, which they'd had time to prepare and build Sangers for. The 105s, the .5 machine guns, which littered the Argentine positions. And also the ground. It was the first time we'd be able to see the ground that we'd been fighting over and the strength of Mount Longdon as a position for a defensive location. The consolation of that battle the day after, though, was that from the top of Longdon, you could clearly see Stanley. We didn't know then how quickly victory would come, but it was with some relief that uh, when two para moved on Wireless Ridge, with three para moving behind them, the enemy crumbled and ran away. Two para, ignoring all orders to the contrary, followed them in to Stanley, and three para followed them in, and we all settled down in Stanley to await the arrival of the rest of the, battali the, rest of the battalions in the task force to catch us up in Stanley. And happily, that was the end of Operation Corporate for us. <laughs>